It was through our parents that we entered into this world, both physically and mentally. Physically in the sense that it was because of their bodies that we have a body. Mentally in terms of what they taught us about the world, how to, how to sit up, how to walk, how to speak, how to engage the world, what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad. They're our entry into the world. So when they pass away, it's as if one of the most important parts of the world has gone. There's a big loss. And the grief that goes along with that is a combination of concern about them, where they're going, and concern about ourselves, because they were a big part of us. It's as if part of ourselves, almost if as if a part of the body was cut off. So we have to recognize that. We have to honor that. That's why even though the Buddha did not encourage grief, he did say that it is wise to give expression to grief. If you see that anything is accomplished by eulogies, dharma talks, Meditation. Go ahead and do that. Because admitting our grief, feeling of grief, is our entry into compassion, both for ourselves and for those around us. If you deny that there's any loss, then it's as if you deny your own suffering. If you deny your own suffering, then you deny the suffering of others. And if you were to live in the world where you were denying the fact of suffering, you'd be a sociopath. So it's good that we stop to take time to feel the grief, express it, but then move on to compassion. Think about all the other people who've lost parents lost children, lost brothers and sisters, lost friends. There's that story in the commentary about the woman who, whose child died. And she couldn't admit that it had died. She needed some medicine, that's what she thought. So people directed her to the Buddha. And the Buddha said, well, the medicine would have to come from a house. It would be something very simple, mustard seeds, but it would have to come from a house where no one had ever died, a family where no one had ever died. So the woman goes around and she asks for mustard seed, and people are willing to give it because it's something very cheap in India. But then she says, oh, by the way, has anyone died in this family? And of course, there were grandparents and parents, sometimes children. And the story goes, at the end of the day she realized, okay, death is everywhere. Her child had died, and she was willing to move on. But what does it mean to move on? Part of us hopes that we'll meet the person who's passed away again, and that the fact of rebirth makes it likely that we could. We can take some, some comfort in that. But then you start to think about it. You meet again, and you're going to lose each other again. Then you meet again, and lose each other again. Think of what the Buddha said about all the, the water, the tears that we shed over having lost a mother, lost a father, lost a sister, a brother, son, daughter. In each case, just like all the mothers you've ever had, all the fathers you've ever had, the amount of tears is more than the water in the oceans. And that's in the past. And you ask yourself, how much further into the future do you want to shed another ocean or two? The same with the contemplation of the fact that there's hardly anybody you could meet that hadn't been a mother at one time, hadn't been your father at one time, hadn't been a sister, brother, son, daughter. And what are they now? You meet them and either you just feel nothing much at all, 
There may be some cases where you feel a rapport, other cases where you feel the opposite of a rapport. The relationship that was once so close now becomes very far away. You begin to get sense, a sense of the meaninglessness of it all. And we're kind and good to one another. But the thirst for that kind of relationship it just is a thirst for more and more suffering. It's good to think about these things. Because as the Buddha said, when you think about them, it inclines the mind to release. You see that getting out of this system would be a good thing. Because it's hard to admit many times. A couple of cases in the canon, a man who has lost his only son goes every day to the, the charnel ground and says, Where are you, my son? Where are you, my son? And one day after having done that for a while, on his way home he stops off to see the Buddha. And here he's been suffering, suffering, suffering for days over the loss of his son. And the Buddha says, Yes. Loved ones are the source of suffering. And the man says, How could that be? Loved ones are the source of pleasure and joy. And he's off and talks to some gamblers, and the gamblers hear what he has to say about his conversation with the Buddha, and they agree with him that loved ones are the source of joy. This is after he's been suffering over his son for days. Word gets to the palace. King Basanity hears the word of this. At that point, he hasn't yet become a student of the Buddha. But Malika, his favorite queen, has. And so he asks her, What is this, this Buddha of yours, teaching that suffering comes from those we love? How can he say that? Well, she's not sure what he means. So she sends someone to ask the Buddha. And the Buddha tells the person about all the people in the, in the city of Sawati who've lost a husband, lost a wife, lost a mother, a child, father, brother, sister, and then go mad, they go wandering through the city. Have you seen my wife? Have you seen my wife? Have you seen my son? Have you seen my son? There was a case of one woman who was married to a husband, but then the parents decided, and that's back in the days of arranged marriages, the parents decided they could make a better deal, make a better match. So they invite her home for a visit, and then they make up their minds they're going to give him to someone else as a wife. She, however, is in love with her first husband, so she sends word to him. So he sneaks in, kills her, kills himself and hopes that they'll be together in the next life. The Buddha said, this is what I mean when I say that loved ones are the source of suffering. So the messenger goes back to the queen and tells him what the Buddha had to say. And so she goes in to see King Basanity and starts asking him, your number one queen, do you love her? Yes. I wonder if something would happen to her and she died. How would that affect you? He said, he said, my very life would be altered. How about your favorite son, your favorite daughter? What if something would happen to them? My life would be altered. How about me? Something would happen to me. My life would be altered. And then she said, this is what the Buddha meant. He says, suffering comes from those we love. It's at that point where the king washes out his mouth and for the first time pays homage to the Buddha. There's another case with Lady Wisaka, who had many grandchildren. But she loses one of her grandchildren. On the way back from the funeral, she stops him to see the Buddha. And here she is, a stream at her already. And the Buddha asks her, Would you like to have as many children 
as our people here, grandchildren, as our people are in Sawati. She said, I'd love to have that many grandchildren. He said, but Sawati is never without people dying. At least one person dies every day, sometimes two, three, four, five. There wouldn't be a day when you wouldn't be going down to the, the cemetery. So she comes to her senses and says, oh yeah, forget about that. It's when we come to our senses that we realize that the best option is not to hope for another round of the same relationship again, but to look for a way out. So it's good to keep these things in mind. We admit that there is a loss when the people we love have died. We also have to realize, though, that if we don't train the mind to look for its happiness inside, in something that doesn't change, then these losses are going to come again and again and again, more oceans of tears. Think about that until it hits home, and then use those thoughts to practice. They give you motivation. We hear again and again that the practice is all about just being with the present moment, finding your satisfaction in the present moment. Well, the Buddha does say, yes, be with the present moment, but not to the present moment for its own sake. It's because there's work to be done here. The things that cause us to want to come back are here, but the skills we can develop so they don't have to come back, those can be developed here as well. Right here is where the work is to be done.